let's get started. Today we have our own Rui Levin, and he's going to tell us about his exciting new soda paper on the odd lines of model cover problem. Thanks, Anish. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, today I'll tell you about the online uh, submodular cover problem. Uh, this is joint work with Anupam Gupta here at CMU. Oh, let's move this. Okay, so let's jump right in. Uh, let me give you a concrete problem uh, to sink your teeth into. And this is actually uh, the initial motivation for our work, so we're sort of true to historical order here. Suppose you have a graph with, uh, let's say, n vertices and some number uh, t of clients. All right, and our goal is to place servers on this graph such that each client can communicate with a server. Now, the graph has uh, uh, capacities on its edges. And for simplicity, let's assume every client has demand 1 and every edge has capacity 1. So every client wants to communicate sort of one unit of flow to some server. All right, but the problem is a little harder than this because we actually don't know anything up front. So instead, we're revealed the clients one by one. And as soon as the client arrives, we have to choose a server to place, such that the client can then route to the server. OK? At time two, uh, we got a second client. Uh, now it can't route to the first server, so we place another server. It routes. We get a third client. And this one uh, actually can reuse the second server, so we're fine. All right? <laughs> OK, so the goal here is to minimize the, the number of servers placed. And the hard part is that the decisions here are irrevocable. So we're not allowed to take back uh, our decisions of where we place the servers. And this models the fact that we've, uh, we imagine that we pay the cost for the server up front. So we don't get it back if we pull the server back. OK, so sometimes uh, when you're solving a problem that seems hard, it's helpful to look at a you know, special case of the problem uh, to get insight. But we're going to do the opposite, actually. And we're going we're gonna to zoom out and see what core features of the problem uh, let us solve it. So, we have some set of uh, choices for our servers. Let's call that set n. And uh, the choices are v1 through vn. So there's n choices. The solution is some subset of these choices. Uh, there's some costs associated with the solution. And for us, that's just the number of servers. There's some notion of coverage quality. We'll call this f. And for us, this is the number of clients that we've covered with some choice of servers. And uh, this is changing online. So the quality of the solution depends on who the clients are. So we can write down a very clean uh, optimization problem uh, and put it in a little box if we like. So we're minimizing over choices of S, subset of this ground set, the cost of S, subject to the constraint that the coverage quality is maximized. Now, if this is all I told you, this is completely not tractable. I need to tell you a little bit more. But thankfully, our problem has a few more features that make it nice. For one, uh, the coverage, the notion of coverage is monotone. So having more servers is only better. So if I have a set A contained in a set B, then f of B is greater than f of A. If this is the case, then I can rewrite my uh, constraint as f of S equals f of N. This makes sense, everybody? Because f is always maximized uh, by taking everything. The function is not negative. This is fairly uh, straightforward. You never have negative number of clients covered. And uh, you might need to show this, but our problem also satisfies something called submodularity, which, if you've never seen it before, is intuitively just um, a decreasing marginal returns property. And I'll say a little bit more about this. So formally, a function is said to be submodular if for any two subsets of the ground set, A and B, uh, proper subsets, where A is contained in B and X is any element outside of B, then F of A union X minus F of A is greater than F of B union X minus F of B. So what this means is that adding x to a gets me more value than adding x to b. We can introduce some, uh, some nice notation. So we'll say that f of s condition on t, or f of s given t, for two, uh, two subsets s and t, is f of s union t minus f of t. So how much value does s add to t, if I already have t? And with this notation, we can rewrite submodularity very concisely, the condition for submodularity. It just says f of x given a is greater than f of x given b. Um, as an example, suppose I'm uh, buying a car. And imagine two worlds, one in which I have one car and one in which I already have two cars. You'd imagine that buying the extra car when I have one car increases my quality of life more than if I have two cars, especially if I already have a fancy car. Right? The second fancy car is like whatever. 
Okay, any questions so far? Great. So this is our problem. We're uh, uh, minimizing, uh, we're, we're choosing a set S of minimal cost such that f of s equals f of n, and f is monotone, non-negative, and submodular in changing online. And we're going to reach for the stars and solve this fully general problem, actually. And we'll get the, the server problem as a corollary. So turns out this has been studied before, um, offline at least. And uh, offline, it's called the submodular cover problem. And it was introduced by uh, Lawrence Wolsey in 1982. And what Wolsey showed is that the greedy algorithm uh, gives a log f max over f min approximation to the uh, optimal solution. Now, what are these parameters? They're measures of the smoothness of the, of the uh, submodular function, how much it jumps. So f max is defined as the maximum marginal value any element gives, and f min is the minimum marginal value. But we constrain uh, uh, f min to be non-zero. Right? So it's the minimum non-zero marginal gain. And this will make more sense uh, as we do some examples. So uh, already this gives a log t approximation for the offline server uh, placement problem. Right? Great. So um, let me convince you that this problem is very powerful. It's very expressive. And it captures uh, a lot of things you may have seen. So for one, it captures the uh, hypergraph vertex cover problem, which also goes by the name set cover or hitting set. But we'll use this terminology for, for clarity. Uh, so what is this problem? We're given a set of uh, vertices and a set of hyper edges, which are just sets containing uh, subsets of these vertices. And we need to pick a minimal number of vertices such that every edge has at least one vertex in it. We've hit every edge. Why is this a modular cover problem? Well, if we let our function be the number of edges covered, then this is, this is exactly our problem. You want to maximize the number of edges covered by some choice of uh, vertices, right? What is f max here? Well, adding any vertex covers me at most t things, right? Or, or most, uh, sorry, edge number of things, which is at most t. And if I add a vertex and I get some non-zero benefit, then I get at least one more edge. So f min is at least one. And so this guarantee, f max of log f max over f min is log t, which is the right answer for, uh, for vertex cover. And I'm using maybe t as an unusual parameter, but I, I want it to align with, uh, with the other parameters I'll use. So, so just uh, use t for the number of edges. OK, so if this is all I told you, that's not that impressive. But uh, you can make this much more general. So consider the partial uh, vertex cover problem. And when I say vertex cover for this talk, I'll mean hypergraph uh, vertex cover. So now if f is the min of this uh, same coverage function and some threshold t, uh, tau, Meaning, like, I can either cover all the edges or stop at some threshold t. Well, this, you know, smells a lot like uh, vertex cover, but it's actually not clearly reducible to it in any uh, simple way. But it is a submodular function. So you can take the minimum of a submodular function and a constant, and it's still submodular, so we automatically get algorithms for this. You can imagine defining capacitated variants of uh, vertex cover, where every vertex is, can only be responsible for some, uh, like, fixed number of edges. You can define capacitated partial vertex cover if you wish. OK. And I'll mention one more problem on this slide. Um, uh, let's call it the min cost max entropy subset problem. So suppose you have a set of random variables. And I tell you, pick me the smallest number of these variables such that they have maximum entropy, joint entropy. Uh, if I let f be this joint entropy function, this f is submodular. So joint entropy viewed as a set function is submodular. And I can solve this problem as well. Now, this problem is not just useful in theory. It also has uh, many practical applications. Uh, and people really do uh, use it in practice. So in robotics, um, uh, people often want to do sensor placement or, or some kind of costly exploration. And you can model this as a submodular cover problem where your, uh, your returns are uh, you know, diminishing. Uh, various resource allocation problems, you can imagine how they're modeled this way. Uh, influence maximization in social networks. Suppose I'm doing like viral marketing and I want to pick like people to bombard with ads or something in a social network. Uh, the list goes on. Document summarization, uh, keyword, uh, keyword selection, feature selection, and so on. And it's really become kind of a popular paper template to reduce one's problem to submodular cover and then use an algorithm as a black box. 
So for set cover, maybe you can't actually write a paper, but uh, uh, if you do this with some modular uh, cover, sometimes you can. So here's a, here's a core dump of, uh, of people who've done this. And I'm not saying it's, it's simple, like sometimes it takes work to show your, your function is submodular. Uh, but but uh, my point here is that um, this is sort of a high impact uh, a domain. And, and these papers that I'm showing you are, are a mix of both theory papers and uh, like application papers. All right, so our problem is not exactly this problem because I said that it's changing online. So let's, let's understand what the formal online model is. At time one, we're given some coverage function F1. At time two, we're given F2, and so on. And what do we want? We want, at time t, we want to cover S such that for all i less than t, we satisfy the coverage constraint for time i. All right, so we're satisfying all the coverage constraints that came before. Let's check that this makes sense in our problem. This, vertex, this uh, client comes in, we place a server. This client comes in, we place a server. And we need our, our uh, solution at every point to satisfy all the coverage constraints of all the previous clients that came. So this is, this is sort of uh, faithful to our original problem. Yes? Um, don't we also want our cover to be uh, expanding over time? Like, we we're not like making a new cover happen. Uh, that's right, yeah. So keep in mind that decisions are irrevocable. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So, so I should have uh, indexed these by, uh, by t, maybe, st, and we want like a, a nested sequence of these uh, sts. So we're only adding to our solution. Yeah. Um, good, and for this talk, let's just assume that the parameters of these functions are all the same. So all the, all the uh, fi's all have the same fmax and fmin parameters, just for simplicity, because otherwise notation will get confusing. Great, so uh, we are more or less ready to state uh, our results. So um, I'll even uh, give you a, a formal theorem statement. In our paper, we show that there exists an efficient randomized uh, algorithm for the online submodular cover problem, which guarantees that for each time t, the expected cost of the solution, st, is within uh, order log n times log t times f max over f min of the optimal sub uh, submodular cover solution at time t. And this is with respect to the offline optimum at time t. Now, if, uh, if this bound has a lot of symbols in it, uh, let me place it in some context for you so that it means something. So in particular, it's tight for online vertex cover. Uh, this problem usually goes by the name online set cover. And it was introduced by Alon et al. actually in 2003. This is the journal version. So Alon, Auerbuch, Azar, uh, Buchbinder, and Naor is the team. And it was a very influential uh, uh, work in the uh, early 2000s, kind of founded a field, uh, subfield of online algorithms. So what is the problem? It's the same vertex cover problem, but you're s revealed the edges one at a time. So you're given this first edge and you immediately have to choose a vertex to cover it. You're given a second edge, maybe it's covered, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so what, is, what does our bound give for this problem? Note that fi here is a zero one function. It says, have we covered the ith edge or not? Okay, so uh, f max and f min are both one here. <coughs> Which means that log n times log t times f max over f min is just log n times log t. And this is the same bound that they show in their paper for a very special case of set cover. Yes? What are n and t? Sorry, so n is the number of, uh, I should have said that, n is the number of vertices, and t is the number of edges. So when you see t, just think time. It's whatever is changing over time. Um, and and uh, this bound is tight, by the way. So uh, Corman showed in, in his uh, master's thesis in 2004 that uh, you can't beat this unless NP is in BPP. All right, so this is the right answer, um, which, which means that we, uh, we can't hope to improve our bound everywhere. And uh, by the way, this gives the uh, log n log t approximation for the online server placement problem because we have the same parameters, f max and f min. OK, so now I can uh, more or less have told you uh, the landscape around our problem, and, and here's what it is. So our problem, online submodular cover, is a, uh, a generalization um, and combination of uh, online vertex cover and submodular cover. And these are in turn both generalizations of vertex cover. So this is the picture, and this is also going to be the roadmap for uh, the remainder of the talk. But uh, yeah, so, so I'll need to explain to you uh, how these various things work, so I can uh, sketch to you how uh, we get our bound. But we'll start at the bottom. 
how does one solve vertex cover? You can solve it in a million different ways, uh, but here's the way that's going to be nicest for us. The first thing we do is we write down an optimization problem in, let's say, a, an integer program. So we're imagining xv is the indicator variable that denotes whether we've selected uh, vertex v, and it's either 0 or 1. We're minimizing uh, the sum over v of cv times xv, which is uh, the cost of the vertices that we've picked. And we have a constraint for every edge that we must pick at least one vertex from this edge. Uh, so we can't solve integer programs, but we can squint and make it an LP. So we allow uh, uh, x to live between 0 and 1 instead of strictly 0 or 1. And we know how to solve linear programs. So we solve it, and we let x star be the optimal solution. The second thing we do is called randomized rounding. Uh, it's, it's very standard, but if you haven't seen it before, what you do is you take each v with probability equal to its LP value. Now, why is this a good idea? Well, for one, what's the expected cost after I do this rounding? It's precisely the LP value, the cost of, of the optimal LP solution. Is this clear to everybody? Why is this true? Yeah, the objective is exactly the expected cost, right? Great. And unfortunately, OK, so the, the objective is fine, but um, we're actually not really guaranteed that it will be for sure feasible. So it's not true that you'll necessarily be feasible, but you can show that uh, each edge is covered with at least some constant probability. In fact, it'll be 1 minus 1 over e, but it doesn't matter. Point is, each edge is covered with constant probability. So if I repeat this log t times, I'm covering a constant fraction each time. After log t rounds, I'll cover something like 1 over t of the vertices. OK, so that's great. So if I cover 1 over t of the vertices, I've probably covered all the vertices. But just to be safe, we'll, uh, we'll do this cleanup step at the end. Yes? You're covering edges? Uh, excuse me, what did I say? Vertices? Yeah, 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 yeah edges. Excuse one me. Minus one over t uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Sorry. 1 minus 1 over e fraction are covered. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, so we're covering edges, to be clear. Good. OK, so we've covered 1 minus 1 over, uh, excuse me, 1 minus 1 over t of the, uh, of the edges. So we have a 1 over t number uh, fraction of the edges remaining. And then uh, we're going to do this cleanup step where we uh, just pick the uh, cheapest vertex available that has some marginal coverage. That doesn't cover nothing. Yes? Um, it doesn't matter. You can just do it on the original graph. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so all this last step does is guarantee that our solution uh, is always feasible. OK? So what's the uh, total cost of this thing? The total expected cost is log t times opt. Log t comes from the fact that we did log t rounds of this rounding. Each time we did rounding, we paid something like opt, or we, we actually paid the LP value which is less than opt. And then the final greedy step in expectation picks up most one set, one uh, vertex, excuse me. Um, and uh, this vertex is the cheapest one available. So in particular, it's cheaper than opt. So we pay something like log t plus 1. OK? All right, so that's uh, vertex cover. That's all I'll say. Now, how do we port this online? We just do it online. Uh, so instead of uh, your, your, uh, your favorite old LP solver, we'll use something I'll call an online LP solver, which was uh, introduced in, this, uh, in this, uh, this work that introduced the problem. And uh, it does the following. So for covering LPs, which are a specific class of LPs, there are ones in which all the coefficients are positive and all the constraints are like greater than uh, signs. It gives two guarantees. One is that it maintains a log n approximate solution as constraints arrive online. So n was the number of uh, vertices. All right? And the second thing it guarantees is that uh, the LP value is only ever increasing over time. Now, if I told you only one of these constraints by itself, well, one of these guarantees by itself, it wouldn't be particularly interesting, right? But together, they're, they're, quite, uh, they're quite interesting. And one reason they're interesting is that you can now perform rounding online. So if this is my LP solution at time uh, t minus 1, and it increases at time t by some vector delta, 
then you can kind of round in slices. All right, so if I take every v at time t with probability proportional to the change, I can guarantee that the probability that v is taken at any point before time t is exactly its LP value at time t. Right? Now, it's not exactly delta v. It's like a slight scaling. But intuitively, this is more or less the picture. It's a very <laughs> simple calculation to figure out what the, uh, the constant should be. Question? Sorry, you said the delta v is increasing along. That's, that's just a product of the, uh, of the healthy solver, the, the R paper. Uh, it's a product? What do you mean? So, so like, the, their algorithm just has that property. That it just has this property, yeah. And we don't need to know how it works. It's a black box for us. Yeah. So far, so good. Any questions? Yeah. So the, we're comparing ourselves to the optimum, which covers all of the functions until now. So it covers all i from 0 to t. Okay, so some adversary that knows the yeah. function can compute, this, compute the sequence. That's right. All right. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. So after we've done this, uh, oh, OK, so what's, what's great about this is that uh, it's as if rounding was performed offline one single time at time t. At every time t, it looks as if we've just performed rounding one single time with respect to the final LP value, which is very cool. OK, and the last thing we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll do this greedy uh, cleanup step. Yes? So I was a bit confused. At, at a certain time, you normalize all the XP values to make a probability distribution. Oh, they're actually constrained to be uh, 0, 1. Oh, so you're independently sampling from each one? Yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. Right. That's, that's important, yeah. Are you doing this rounding step at each time in the? Yeah. Is that going to kill you in the competitive ratio? No, so it's as if we did rounding one single time. That's what's, that's what's cool. It, at, every point time, at every time t, it's, it looks as if so we've the, just done the, it once. The greedy step, right? You need a feasible solution at each time. Yeah, the greedy step might hurt us. Right. Yeah. So, OK, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to this actually in, in a few slides. But we'll, we'll just increase the number of rounds to make greedy like uh, 1 over time. And then we can sum over time, actually, and just get, uh, you, you'll see this in a moment. So yeah. Did, did that confuse you, or did it help? Yeah. Any more questions? OK. So we do the, uh, the same thing. Um, and the total expected cost here is log n times log t. Log n, because we're losing log n, we're only uh, maintaining a log n approximate LP solution. And then rounding loses another log t when we perform log t rounds of the rounding. <coughs> Good? Sorry, is it that the rounding does this, or that the greedy adding the vertex loses the log t? Um, the greedy is actually really cheap. So you do enough, like it's exactly the same analysis as for vertex cover. The, once you've done sufficiently many rounds of rounding, an expectation the greedy step costs almost nothing. But you, I mean, you're doing an expectation once, but you're doing it on every single time step. Yeah, so if we just increase the number of rounds by a, like a t factor, that's why the, you'll see it in a few slides, actually. Sorry, yeah. Um, it'll make sense. But if you do sufficiently many rounds, then even, even if I sum over all time, it's still very few. Okay. Um, so this is the method of alterations, really. Like, we're doing something random and then fixing it. OK, and OK, so this is our plan. Uh, we have a three-step plan. Keep it in mind. Uh, write an LP, solve it, round online, and then perform this uh, greedy cleanup phase. So we'd like to take our, our framework and apply it to uh, some modular cover. This is going to be our, our program. We should step here. Uh, and so if we're going to do this, if we're going to do step one, we better write down an LP for submodular cover. And this is uh, more or less the only LP that, that is known for submodular cover. And it's, uh, we'll call it Wolsey's LP, because Wolsey uh, uh, wrote it in his, in his uh, first uh, paper that introduced the problem. And the LP is the following. It's sort of mysterious when you first see it. Uh, we're imagining xj is, again, like uh, indexing into our set of choices. We have the same cost function as before. But now we have this constraint for every subset of the ground set. And it says that f of s plus the sum over j and n minus s of the marginal value of j2s times xj is greater than f of n. So it's scary and it's a mouthful. But uh, let me try to give you, I'll give you 
maybe two intuitions for this LP, but uh, yeah. That is exponentially many constraints. Totally. Yeah. Keep it in mind. Absolutely. <laughs> um, one, thing, one thing to keep in mind is, is uh, in online algorithms, it's not even clear that uh, information theoretically, you have enough information to get a competitive solution. And so it's even interesting to, to spend exponential time and get a competitive solution. But I promised you an efficient algorithm, so we'll, we'll have to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah, good, good observation. OK, so what's an intuition for this uh, LP? If we just, uh, if we imagine that submodularity is something like discrete concavity, OK, then we can uh, reinterpret this, this constraint as follows. We imagine that this vector that's indexed by j, where every position is f of j given s, is kind of like uh, the gradient at s. And uh, the vector that um, has support only in n minus s and uh, is, is xj in each of those coordinates is kind of like the displacement from uh, s to x. So our constraint is kind of saying that this like f of s plus the gradient dotted with the displacement is greater than f of n. No. Uh, that's the definition of concavity, but that's what this constraint is saying. Yeah. So let's just hallucinate completely and imagine that uh, we have a concave function. And we want our LP to, uh, we have some, some LP value x, and we want our LP to constrain f of x to lie above a uh, threshold f of n. So what is this really saying? It's kind of saying pick a point s and draw the supporting hyperplane at s. Now this, this thing, this f of s plus uh, the gradient dotted with the displacement is like the projection of x onto the hyperplane. That's tangent at s. And so this constraint is saying this point better lie above the threshold, which makes sense. So if we do indeed have a feasible solution, if f of x is above f of n, by concavity, it's uh, any hyperplane lies above the function. And so its projection onto the hyperplane should be above itself, which means it is also above f of n. Yeah. Just to be clear, before we were thinking of our solution as s, but now s is like other solutions that aren't ours, and our solution is x. Totally. It's, it's any other point, yeah. The one, any other point is s, and our, our solution, the one we're like temporarily outputting is x. That's right. Yeah. And OK, so this means this is a, a relaxation. So we, our, our uh, convex uh, body defined by these constraints uh, has all of the integer points. But we also don't have any extraneous points. And the reason for this is that we're also, you know, you can, you can also, uh, you're also satisfying the constraint for the tangent that's like uh, the, the plane that's tangent at x. So if x is, is an integral solution, we're also satisfying that hyperplane, which is itself. So that also means that uh, we're above the constraint. Excuse me, if we're feasible to the constraint, that means that we are uh, uh, a legit feasible solution. Can we get the tangent at s? Yeah, but we're also, I'm, I'm giving the other direction. Yeah. So I'm saying, like, if you have a feasible, uh, uh, we, said, we said one thing. We said if you have a feasible integral solution, you're feasible to the LP. And I'm saying if you have a feasible solution to the LP, you're also, and your integral, excuse me, you're also a uh, combinatorial solution. This is not super important. But we've more or less hand-waved our way to uh, this proof that, uh, and this is in uh, Wolsey's original paper, that T is feasible to uh, the combinatorial submodular cover problem if and only if its characteristic vector is feasible to the LP. Questions? No. OK, and we'll do one more uh, just notational uh, cleanup step. So let me define this F star uh, thing. F star, uh, the function f star of x to be the minimum over all s of this business in the left-hand side of the constraints. Don't think too hard about, about this. Um, we're just using this to, excuse me, to clean up our notation. So with this notation, we can write f star. Uh, we can replace all of these exponential many constraints with just f star of x is greater than f of n. Yes? So in your picture, where would f star x be? Yeah, so uh, it's, if you draw all of the tangent hyperplanes, it's the one that's tightest to you. Yeah, and you're the projection onto the tightest hyperplane. So to be clear, you draw the tangent hyperplanes at every integral point. That's right. And then this one, but 
the x we care about is not an integral point, and then this hyperplane is the one that comes closest to our non-integral point. Exactly. Everybody catch that? For our purposes, we actually don't need any of this intuition. I just don't want to throw some uh, mess on the board without really explaining it. All you need to think when you see f star is that it is in our constraints. Okay, and I've written uh, on the board here, just for a reference, I've written uh, the LP in, in both forms. Just so you, you have it in mind. But just think f star, left hand side in the constraints. Yes? So we also sum up over n minus s, right? Uh, yeah, so it's actually the same thing, sorry. I, why is it the same thing? Do you, do you see why it's the same thing? Because j, j in s gives no marginal value. Yeah. I just put this uh, here to, to make it look like a displacement vector. OK, anyway, it doesn't matter. OK, so here's our, uh, the, the big question is, can we mimic the online vertex cover strategy with this LP? All right, let's go. So here's our framework, our one, two, three step. Uh, solve the LP. Round, online, and then do this greedy alteration step for cleanup. Let's write some uh, case notes. So this is a covering LP. All the, constraints are po uh, the coefficients in the constraints are positive, and they all point the right way. So we can use the online LP solver, and we'll only lose a log n, as before. So make a note that n is the number of variables. It's not the number of constraints. If it were log of the number of constraints, we would be uh, in bad shape, because we have an exponential number. But how do we solve this LP in polynomial time? So uh, Brian, was it? As Brian noted, we have exponentially many constraints per batch. What are we imagining? We have a function fi coming in at every point in time, and we're just going to take its bundle of constraints from the, uh, from the LP and just like, shove them into one big LP. So it's an exponential number of constraints per batch. What's even worse is that even checking feasibility of this LP is provably NP-hard. OK? So these are fairly serious uh, concerns. You know, your instinct should be, if you do approximation algorithms, like find a separation oracle, use the ellipsoid algorithm, but there's some trouble here, right? OK, the second, uh, the second point, uh, rounding, given a, let's just say we have a, a feasible LP solution, and uh, the optimal LP solution, we can round as before. We can just take each, each, uh, each j with probability xj. Right? We can perform the rounding as before, but why should it work? There's no edges to cover this time. There's just this nebulous submodular function, and we somehow need to argue about the coverage as a whole. All right? And finally, uh, for step three, it's not immediate how to bound the cost of greedy, and this is very related to uh, step two, because greedy is cleaning up whatever rounding did not cover. All right, so for uh, what remains of the talk, I have about 30 minutes. I'll just try to um, sketch what we do. So we'll start, with, we'll start with a rounding. I'll leave the polynomial time uh, discussion of how to, to get this to work in polynomial time till the end. I have about one slide, and hopefully we'll make it there. But uh, we'll start with rounding. And uh, we'll first do a kind of warm-up version, where we don't get the full f max guarantee that I, that I promised. We'll do log n times log t times f of n over f min where f of n is, is the entire uh, value of the submodular function uh, for each of these like, f of i's coming in over time. Right? So in general, f max can be way, way, way smaller than f of n. Yes? To be clear, for the original problem you mentioned, yeah. uh, the first one is sufficient? Is That's right, the bound that I showed you, yes. Okay. Yeah. But this is, this is a finer bound. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? OK, let's jump in. So let's start with this. Our uh, uh, main, uh, main tool here will be this, this nice theorem of uh, Jan Vondrak in 2007 in his PhD thesis. And it says that if f is monotone and non-negative, f is a set function, then the expected value, if I sample a set s according to a probability vector x, so x is a vector where each entry is a, is a number between 0 and 1, and I sample each coordinate independently with probability uh, equal to that coordinate, then the expected value of f on this set s is at least 1 minus 1 over e times f star. Why is this cool? Well, I can write the following chain of inequalities. Why is the first one true? Yeah, it's, it's the theorem, right? Good. Yeah, you're awake. Why is the second one true? 
<laughs> yeah, it's the constraint in the LP. Look at the second version of the LP. And so I promised you a second intuition for the LP. And uh, as, far as, as far as I know, this is, this is uh, kind of new in our work. This LP is, is constraining random rounding to get you at least some constant fraction of the entire coverage. That's what this LP is really doing. It's forcing rounding to work. Make sense? So the, the hypothesis does not require some modularity? It does not, yes. Which is actually important for us. Yeah. It's interesting that it does not. Um, good, so, so this, is, uh, this is this. And this property holds recursively. So even if we condition on having picked some other set, and we look at the residual function f and redo this rounding, again, we'll cover a constant fraction of what's remaining. So this means if we, do, uh, if we do k rounds of rounding, we let r be the result of these k rounds, we get that the expected coverage of r is 1 minus e to the negative k times f of n. So imagine we've covered all but 1 over e, like we, we've walked all but 1 over e distance to where we're going, and then we walk, so, so we have 1 over e remaining, and then all we have is 1 over e of that remaining, then we should have 1 over e squared of that remaining after two steps. After k steps, we have e to the negative k. And this is great because we can just plug in uh, our parameter. We set k equal to ln t times f of n over f min. And now, what is this, uh, what is this uh, thing on the left? This is the expected value of f of n minus f of r, which is the expected amount that we have not yet covered. That's what you should think of this as. By our choice of parameters, it, just rearranging a tiny bit, this is less than f min over t. It's clear? The f of n cancels this f of n. OK. Now, uh, we're in good shape because uh, Greedy will pick 1 over t elements in expectation per time step. This maybe answers your question, Isaac? Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll answer it in a moment. So why is this true that Greedy picks 1 over t elements in expectation? If I have this remaining amount to cover, how much does Greedy cover with every choice of, uh, of an element? At least f min, by definition. Cool. So, at most 1 over t in expectation. And now because 1 over t in expectation per time step, we can just sum over all time steps. Maybe this is uh, CJ's question. Uh, we can sum over all time, uh, time steps and get that the expected cost of greedy over all time step until t is at most opt. Yes? So, I, I haven't seen this before, but it's, it's not immediately clear to me why uh, you need the greedy step. Because it seems to me like, the, like if you just buy a coupon collector, if you just apply it, you know, the, the sampling step, then like everything should be sampled because you're doing the walk t times. Yeah, we want a probability one algorithm. But actually... Okay, so, but it's okay, but if you just wanted to hold it one step... That's right. Probability. We kind of like this view of the, the one, two, three uh, step view of this, this process because it, you'll see it in a moment when I do the version two of the rounding. Um, but it would, be, but it would, be, it would work if you didn't have the greedy you like scale by... Yeah. I'm fudging this thing. It actually doesn't matter. Um, you can assume, for simplicity, just assume you know t. And we're, yeah. Uh, you can actually do it such that uh, you do it at every, yeah, at every t. Um, we, we can chat about that. It's extremely simple. It's just like cluttering uh, if, I, if I go into this, yeah. Is this uh, more or less clear to everybody? What this gives us is, is uh, log t times f of n over f min times opt bound. This is just from rounding, and then we get one more opt cost from, from the greedy step at the end. Any questions? Okay, let's do uh, the harder version. So if we're going to do uh, an f max over f min algorithm, we better be able to do it in the special case of vertex cover. All right? So for vertex cover, what, what is... Uh, what is the analogous notion to f max over f min? Well, we said we, last time we, we talked about this, we said f max was at most t, where t is the total number of edges. But that we can be a little bit more precise. We can say f max is at most d, where d is the max degree of any vertex in this graph. All right? So we'd like to do an analysis that's, that gives, gives us a log d approximation. OK, so the first thing we'll do is we, uh, we'll take our graph, our hypergraph, and we will. Uh, 
assign each edge to some vertex of op that covers it. And we do so arbitrarily. We break ties arbitrarily. So this edge could have been green, but it doesn't matter. Now we perform uh, k equals log d rounds of rounding. If we're going to get a log d bound, we better not do log t rounds of rounding, because then we already lost log t and we'd be done. So let's stop at log d. OK, and imagine for, for visual uh, clarity, we just yanked those edges out of the graph, the ones that were covered by the rounding. And I drew uh, black circles around the vertices that were selected. OK, so we, have to, we, have to, we still have to cover these, these two edges. Let's uh, think for a sec. What is the expected degree of some vertex in opt after rounding? Well, every edge is covered with constant probability, specifically 1 minus 1 over e. And so if I do k rounds of rounding, by linearity of expectation, O's degree will be e to the minus k times its original degree. Right? Uh, by our choice of k, this is less than the degree of O before rounding divided by d. But the degree is the most d, right, by definition, so this is the most one. Now we run greedy. And greedy just very, uh, very naively just picks the cheapest vertex available that has non-zero coverage. So maybe it'll pick this one. It wasn't smart. It didn't pick the one in the intersection. It picked this one, and then it picked this one. And uh, the idea for how the, to do the analysis uh, from now on is to say, OK, charge each element of greedy, each vertex selected by greedy, to the vertex in op to which it contributes. So we'll say that this vertex contributed to this vertex of opt because it took away from the edges that it's covering, and this one contributed to this one. Now we can show three things. One is that uh, greedy is cheaper than the O and opt to which it contributes. Is this obvious? Why is this true? It's greedy. It's greedy. It's picking the cheapest thing of all, and if O and opt was, you know, had some edges that were uncovered, then it was available as a choice, which means that greedy is necessarily choosing something cheaper than that. I mean, it could choose the exact same thing, right? It could choose the blue star if that was the cheapest. So there's no reason for it to be strictly cheaper. Second thing is that every gene uh, in greedy contributes at least one by our definition of the greedy algorithm. It picks something with non-zero coverage, and if it's non-zero, it's at least one. And uh, we just argued above that every O and opt has at most one thing contributing to it in expectation. So we've more or less, in expectation, created a matching between the things selected in greedy and the things selected by opt. Each thing in greedy is cheaper than the thing in opt, so the entire value of greedy is less than the entire value of opt. Is this clear? Okay. Let's move on to uh, our problem. Are log t times f max over f min rounds sufficient? So again, if we want this bound, we better stop it at this number of rounds of rounding. So let's try to do the exact same thing. We want to do the equivalent of assigning every edge to a vertex in opt, right? How do we do this? One way is to just order all the elements of opt arbitrarily, like O1 to OS, let's say. And we give each uh, element of opt its coverage condition on what came before it. So O1 is responsible for f of O1. OI is responsible for f of OI given O1 to OI minus 1. Right? So just as we assigned edges to, to vertices, we're now assigning like coverage value to, uh, to elements of opt. We perform some number of rounds of rounding. And uh, we'd like the coverage values of all these things in opt to shrink somewhat. Okay, so just as previously, we, you know, we imagined yanking out the vertices, excuse me, the edges that we've covered. You've yanked out some of the, uh, the value of, of up. In a similar way, like the marginal coverage decreases after you do rounding. Let's just suppose for now that this uh, decrease behaves like we expect it to. So we, let's just suppose that the expected value of uh, each element of opt decreases in the same exponential fashion as before. This is great, because uh, if k is this parameter that we set exactly as we did before, just, just substituting in for k, we get this, f of oi times f min over f max times t. Now, f of oi is by definition at most f max. This is why we, we picked this bound. And so this is at most f min over t. 
And this should kind of look familiar, familiar to you uh, at this point. So now we run greedy, and greedy does something. It picks some elements with non-zero coverage. And these elements kind of bite out of the contribution of each of these uh, elements of opt. So maybe the first element selected by greedy bites this out from each of the contributions of each, each thing in opt. The second one comes along and it bites this amount out. Now we want to argue kind of like we did before, that, okay, every G and greedy is cheaper than the O and opt to which it contributes. G and greedy contributes at least something, and O and opt has at most something contributing to it. But it's kind of unclear what contribution should mean here. Like we, don't, we don't have edges. There's no, no longer this like, atomic reasoning that we can do. This brings me to our, uh, one of our um, uh, contributions. So we introduced this concept of mutual coverage. Okay? And this is going to capture the right notion of contribution for our purposes. So we define the mutual coverage between two subsets of the ground set, A and B, to be f of A plus f of B minus f of A union B. Right? If you uh, rearrange it, you can write it as f of A minus f of A given B, which is really exactly what we want. It's how much is B taking away from the value of A. Right? And it's symmetric in A and B, so it's, you can write it with, with B and A switched. Does this look familiar to anybody? It, uh, it actually generalizes mutual information from information theory. So I mentioned very briefly that uh, entropy viewed as a set function is submodular. So if you took the definition of mutual information from information theory and just replaced every occurrence of entropy with F more generally, you get exactly this definition. And uh, it's nice to know that this, um, uh, this quantity mutual information respects the same chain rule uh, as in information theory. It's not the chain rule from calculus. Okay, and we use, we use this, uh, this fact quite heavily in our analysis. Okay, so uh, I won't spend too much more time on the details because there's some algebra you need to do, but more or less we show what we want, which is that every G and greedy contributes at least F min overall, and every O and opt has at most F min contribution to it in expectation. Yeah. Excuse me? So I'm asking what, what property of this rounding are you using in your analysis? This is, this is the important part. So just as before, we needed rounding to remove sufficient like, amount of coverage from each element of opt to get the expected contribution to opt to be one. To eat, right? Before we said every vertex in opt, an expectation has at most one thing that's contributing to it. That's after rounding. And it's very important that the rounding do that. Yeah, and so it's, it's kind of this property. But that's actually a good question. You'll see in a moment. Yeah? Sorry, so what's the definition of contribution? Does it just involve mutual information? It's exactly mutual information. Between Sorry. what and what? Between G and greedy. Sorry. Between, uh, so every element in greedy okay. and an element in opt, the contribution of G to O is the mutual information between G and O, given all the elements of opt and greedy that came before both of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so one thing to, uh, to, maybe it's not, not important, but we actually no longer, each of these bytes that we take out of uh, an element in opt is no longer actually at least F min. All we're guaranteed is that a G and greedy's total contribution is F min across all of the things in opt. So we no longer have an integral matching between uh, greedy and opt. It's now some kind of fractional matching. So the analysis is a tiny bit more involved, but this is the intuition. Questions? All right, so there's one issue remaining, which I brushed under the rug, which was this, this inequality. And Ainesh, you wanted to know what the property was of, of rounding that we need, it's this one. We're, we're just um, going for an expectation bound. Yeah, and that's just the criterion that we're, we're going for. So we'd like this inequality, we, that we get an exponential decrease of each contribution of, of a, everything in opt. But it needs a little bit more justification. 
In fact, it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a problem. And uh, it has to do with the fact that mutual information is not submodular. So imagine I have uh, n binary coins that are IID 0, 1, and one coin that's the XOR of all the coins that came before. And now we look at the mutual information between uh, the prefix of the first i coins and the last coin. As i grows, I mean, until i hits n, the mutual information is zero. I have no information about, about this thing. Only when I've seen all of the coins up to n do I finally get a jump in mutual information. So it stays low, 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 and then it shoots up. So it's not submodular. OK, and if our whole, yeah, so if our idea of contribution is, is this mutual information, we won't get this, like, uh, this nice uh, exponential decrease. But you can fix it. And you can fix it just by forcing it to be true. All right? So you just write a stronger LP. This is our first LP. And we write this LP. So don't, don't think too hard about this. I don't have much more time to, to tell you the details of how this works. But more or less, every time you see an F of J, you replace it of the mutual information of J to V. And now we index our constraints over all subsets and over all V. We show in our, in our paper that this is both a, uh, a tighter, a strictly tighter LP, actually, than this one. So it's strictly better. And it's still a relaxation. And uh, from here on, we more or less can use uh, the same theorem of Vondrack that related the value of rounding uh, uh, to the LP constraints to get the, the exponential decrease that we desire. That's, that's all I'll say for now, but uh, any questions? Pravesh, maybe this uh, relates to your question from before. So it's crucial, actually, that this theorem not use the modularity. Yeah. yeah. Good? OK, in uh, how much time do I have? Eight minutes? OK, perfect. So um, let me just say a quick word about how to solve this in polynomial time. So we want to repeat the following until feasible. Find a violated constraint, and then feed it to the online LP solver. And just repeat until you're feasible. OK, so we have a few issues. We need to show that we can find violated constraints quickly. We don't know how to do this. But even if you could find a violated constraint quickly, there's an exponential number of them. For all we know, all of them are violated. And fixing one doesn't fix any of the others. And we still you know, spend an exponential time per, per constraint. So we need to deal with these things. Oh, sorry. Yeah, second point. And uh, the idea for, for solving this is um, that we don't actually need to find a violated constraint always. We really can get away with only doing it when rounding does not work, whatever that means. So imagine I have an LP solution, and it's infeasible. But for whatever uh, weird reason, rounding gets me, all the, like, gets me sufficient bang then who cares if the original solution was infeasible? Uh, said another way, you can kind of use the rounding algorithm as a separation oracle. Yeah? How do you get a solution in the first place? Uh, you, I mean, you do this process, right? You find a violated constraint and fix it. Fixing it involves, OK, start at 0. Find a violated constraint, fix it. I necessarily increase my LP value and, and repeat this. Oh, yeah. I haven't told you how to find the violated constraints. I've, I've uh, hinted, but uh, yeah. So a corollary of the same theorem of Vondrack is that if rounding is sufficiently like, bounded away from what it should be, like the expected value of rounding is like a constant gap away from, from the, what we want it to be at, then this means that f star, which is just this left-hand sign in the constraints, is very much away by a constant from, uh, from what, we, when, what we need it to be at. So if rounding does not work, we're very violated. And this is a large margin violation. In our work, we show two things. One is that if we fix these large margin violations, we can, after O of n large margin violations, the solution is necessarily feasible. So this addresses point number two. If, if these are the kinds of constraints you fix, you don't need to fix all of the constraints. 
And second, this theorem is inherently very much not constructive. It only says that f star is less than this, this thing. And f star, recall, was the min over all s of the left-hand side of the constraints. So it just says that there exists some constraint that's very violated. It doesn't show you how to find it in polynomial time. In our work, we show uh, how to make this constructive uh, efficiently. That's more or less the story. Um, let me leave you with uh, the, the bound that we give for our problem. So we solve the online submodular cover problem. We get a competitive ratio of log n times log t times f max over f min. We combine uh, the modeling power of submodular cover with the robustness to uncertainty of online vertex cover. So any application of submodular cover, you can now more or less uh, port to an online setting if you have a reasonable model of how the constraints should arrive online. We introduce this notion of mutual, information, uh, mutual coverage, excuse me, which generalizes mutual information, uh, which was crucial in our analysis, and we hope that it uh, finds uses in other analyses of uh, submodular uh, functions. We give a new LP for submodular cover that is strictly tighter than the known LP. And we give the first uh, randomized rounding algorithm for, uh, for Wolsey's LP. And this is via this, this round or separate routine. That's all I have. Thanks. Any questions? So all of your guarantees are in terms of expected costs? Yes. If you want to move to the not expected costs, like is there hardness? Is there reason to believe that you shouldn't be able to get a guarantee like this? Well, But you're not allowed to take back your decisions, so. Uh, so you're not, you're, you're just like doing a bunch of times. Then. And then oh, taking oh, the best one, yeah. yeah. So uh, usually these things are phrased in terms of expected cost. Uh, yeah, let me think, I should, yeah. Maybe, maybe we should talk offline, yeah. I don't have a quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to make an answer and it's irrevocable. <laughs> it's okay, you can automate your answer. Yeah. One question. So this says star is not one of those known extensions, the wall that's short. It is actually. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about this. It's its own. It's called the Wolsey extension. Well, it's not called the Wolsey extension. I'm calling it the Wolsey extension. Oh, but it's not one of those. It, it is known. So um, uh, Jan, Jan uh, von Draken, that theorem that he stated, uh, he actually phrased it in a slightly different language. He phrased it in terms of like uh, continuous extensions. And he, he called it F star, but he didn't like give it a name. But he knew about this. And I mean, yeah. And you, you, you have to show that it's uh, an extension. But uh, it's not too hard to show. I get it, but is it, it's not the multilinear node. It's neither the, the multilinear nor the Lovash, you know, nor these like concave or convex like extensions. No, it's its, its own thing. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, by the way, it's only an extension when f is submodular. <laughs>